OK, so we're going to get started. I uh, apologize for Monday. I think this is the first time in 10 years I've been gone three days in a semester. I have no idea why I got the stomach flu, but <laughs> I did. So I uh, spent a lot of time enjoying that really nice porcelain white object in the bathroom. Um, when I would have rather been here with you. So I apologize for that, but I'm back, kind of. And uh, we'll see if we can make today work a little bit better. Uh, hopefully, you guys were able to do some SketchUp, which is what I sent you guys in the email. Um, the exercise numbers are all messed up right now, so we'll get that sorted out, and everybody will get credit for it. Um, but I picked that one, uh, even though it's a little bit of a leap ahead, because SketchUp is something everybody seems to be able to pick up really fast. So it keeps us on track. It keeps us without losing days, uh, and we can keep going. Today, we're going to go back into the world of AutoCAD. Um, and we're going to talk about elevations. But before we actually get to physically constructing the elevations in AutoCAD, I want to talk through line weights in a little bit more graphic sense so you can see why line weights are important. I, I verbally talked about it, but I think sometimes showing it in lecture makes a difference. And line weights, especially in elevation, really start to matter because they can make your building seem really flat or they can really jazz it up and, and make it seem like an attractive thing that you want to go visit or thing that you want to build, etc. So we're going to talk through line weights. Some of this is, is obvious. Some of it maybe is, is something slightly new. So when I talk about a line weight, it refers simply to the thickness or the darkness of a line. And this is back in the old days when we used to draw with pencils or we used to draw with pens. This is where it mattered. You picked up a different lead pencil depending on how thick or dark you wanted that particular line to be. This basic graphic property has an enormous effect on what the drawing turns out to be or how three-dimensional that drawing feels. We look to those line weights to see what's happening in a drawing. And if you learn to use them correctly, it's very, very effective. So without actually having to draw a 3D object, you can make something feel like it's three-dimensional. Um, there's also a whole range of line types, dash, dotted, etc that help us learn what's going on in a particular drawing. And we'll use some of them in particular places. Um, and some of that's a little bit more technical. We won't do too much of that in this class, though I'll introduce you to the concept um, so that you're aware that these line types exist. Line styles. Again, these are things that you probably went over in 130. I'm hoping you did. But we have solid lines. These are visible objects, things that can be seen easily. That's what we're drawing. There's, they're solid. Dashed lines or hidden lines, I tend to call them hidden lines, not dashed lines. It's a, it's a personal preference. They refer to things that are hidden behind other objects. So we show that as a dashed line. So when you're looking at a building elevation or you're looking at um, you know, a floor plan or something like that, and you see a dashed line, that's a convention that's telling you, oh, this is something that's hidden behind something else. It's here, but you can't see it right now. Then we have movement or phantom lines. These are, these are not quite so common. Um, it can be, they call them movement lines. It's like a door swing, that arc. I tend never to draw them as an actual phantom line. Um, I didn't draw it as a solid line. But technically speaking, uh, you could draw them as a phantom line. Leader annotation lines, those are dimensions or arrows. We, don't, we won't do any of that in this class. Break lines are those squiggly lines. And I'll show you an example of these in a little bit. Those are those squiggly lines that say, this object is really big, and I can't show it all, so I'm going to break it here and cut it off. Maybe on a set of stairs, for example, you want to show what's underneath the stairs. You draw that little break line. Center lines, this is something that's centered, obviously, in the middle of a circle, etc. A section line is something that's, that's showing that we're cutting through something. We're cutting through the building in a certain way. Uh, and dimension lines are a lot like the annotation lines. Line thicknesses, and they're shown here. I think this is a really good chart in terms of explaining line thickness. So when we, when we get to line weights, construction lines are when you're first laying out your, your drawing. Let's say you're in 130 and you're drawing by hand. You get out that 6H lead. Anybody actually drawn with 6H lead before? It's almost impossible to draw a dark line with 6H lead. You, 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 in, either you're going to cut through the paper if you push too hard. Like, it's so hard. So the lines are always really light. In AutoCAD, so we're seeing 6H and 4H um, here. I mean, instead of pointing there, I'll point here. We're seeing 6H and 4H right there. 
Notice also that next to it, it has the millimeter thickness. This is equivalent to AutoCAD millimeters. So when we're doing line weights in AutoCAD, somewhere between 0.00 and 0.1, those are our little thin construction lines. These lines, or this thickness here, in points, 0.18 to 0.25, that's Illustrator. So we're seeing AutoCAD here and Illustrator here. And then obviously, if manual hand drawing back there. Light lines, so these are action lines, door swings, information lines, um, hatches typically, fill patterns, those kinds of things. Those light lines are about 0.1 millimeter. When, when I was showing you guys the example on the back of the little handout, I gave it to you again today, and I pointed out that door swing. Guess what? I said 0 0.09 millimeters, which is right at about 0 0.10. So that's, that's for action. That's for things that are movable. They're not supposed to be hard to see like construction lines. They're there. You're trying to see them, but they're really thin. Then we move into the medium lines. These are things like furniture, cabinets, things that are in your building, toilets. Right? Somehow that's on my brain, right? Bold, bold lines. These are the big, thick lines in your drawing. So outermost boundaries of objects, silhouette lines, empty space that separates, those kinds of things. And then finally, we get to the cut lines. Well, technically, a floor plan, when you cut through the walls, those are cut lines. That's why they're 0.4. But they could be even, uh, even thicker. We cut through the ground. We're going to do that a lot today. In our section, we're going to cut through the ground. It's going to be even thicker, up to like a one-point line. It's a big, thick, heavy line. Uh, and that's what it should be. All right. Visual distance is another thing that we use line weights for. And I think this chart is a good way of, of seeing it. So if we're looking down, so the little, the little icon at the top is supposed to be kind of like an eyeball looking down. And we're looking through that red plane. I should probably be drawing on this while I do it. Let me change the color back to red. I like drawing in red a little bit better here. So this is our eyeball. And we're looking down through this plane right here at this object. The drawing that results down here at the bottom is showing us what the various line weights are. So we see on the two edges, as we look through that, the two edges are thick of that plane. We're going to show those edges as thick on either side, right there and there. And this little cut in the surface is small and thin. Therefore, we're going to show it as small and thin. If we look at this next view, as we look down, this part of the object is much closer to us than that part of the object is. So as we draw it, we draw our thickest line where it's closest, there and there. We draw our next lines here and here in terms of thickness. And this last set here is the furthest away. Therefore, they're the thinnest. So we're changing our line weights based on how far away it is from us. In an ideal world, or if you were drawing this by hand, these diagonal lines right there and right there would actually go from thick to thin. They would taper as you're going away. And you can see that effect really easily if you're doing it by hand. Doing that on a computer is really challenging. You can technically do it, but it's too much work. So we just pick a line weight that's in the middle of the two. But technically speaking, if you were drawing it by hand, you'd make it thick to thin, and it would show that that tapers away from you. Question? Well, you draw two lines over there. there should be two lines over there. I didn't draw this. But I agree, there should be two lines. Go figure. OK, moving on to the third one, where we jump straight down here. They're drawing lines here and here with a little bit thicker representing that edge, saying that there's something underneath it. But there is no hidden line for that bottom edge, because we don't know how far away it is. And then we end up with these two lines being thinner at the bottom plane. This last fold, where it folds under itself here, we have the two lines the same, a really bold, thick line there. And then here's our introduction of the hidden line, that dashed line that I was talking about that shows something underneath a particular object. So we're using a whole bunch of line weights in this last drawing here to represent a lot. And so you should be able to not see this at all and to see this drawing and understand what's happening. 
That's a good visual challenge to understand what's happening in that particular uh, view. So here's more of the lines as they show up here. Uh, our section lines are thick. They tend to have the little tails on the end. There's different styles depending on uh, as you become a designer uh, or an architect, you're going to end up using different styles here, depending. These are all section lines, um, and different, different people use different ones. I have a tendency to use this one, or sometimes they use that one. I almost never use this one, but it's just it's a personal preference. And this one with the letter is if you have lots of sections and you want to be able to delineate this is section A, B, etc. So you've got different options there as you go forward. Um, mine actually is kind of a hybrid of the two, but anyway. Dimension lines are usually very thin. I almost always leave my dimension lines at 0, 0.00, so they're nice, thin, crisp, black lines. Uh, text is really important when you get to dimensioning, but we're not going to do dimensioning in this class, so that's OK. Break line is usually pretty thick. This is that little jagged piece that I was talking about. Um, basically, you're drawing this. It's kind of like one of those heartbeats. And we're showing that, but that means that we're breaking what it is and it's continuous, but we're not showing the continuous part of it. Or we're shortening the object so that it shows up um, on, c on, the, uh, on the screen or on the drawing. Movement, or phantom line, has two dashes and then a long dash. Center line is a long dash and a short dash. A dash line or a hidden line is just a bunch of even dashes. And then we have our leaders with the little arrows on the end. We'll get into that when we get to Illustrator a little bit more. So these two objects, or these four objects, are definitely flat right now. But if you look at them, based on the line weights, you can kind of see what pieces are popping out towards you, what are in front, what are behind. So it's just through the use of the line weights that you're able to discern how these are three-dimensional. If I took the line weights away altogether, you wouldn't see any of this as three-dimensional. It would be just a series of lines. So this is where line weights become really, really important. So I had to throw one of these kinds of drawings in. This is what elevations used to look like when you used to draw by hand. And so here's an elevation of a building. It's more of a sketch elevation. It's not a technical elevation. But this is a great illustration of how line weights make this building feel like a building. It's not flat. It doesn't read uh, like just a flat little sketch. It has a lot of thickness. So a couple key elements on this particular drawing that we'll start with. First thing is the ground line. I talked about that being the thickest line. It's always going to be the thickest line on your elevation drawing. So it's at the bottom. Typically, there's some kind of a hill that slopes up. It's very rare that you have the perfectly flat site. In, in our case, I'm going to show you today how you can actually construct what that line is so that you technically know how to do it, but it's not required. You can draw it as a flat line, and I'll accept that as part of your assignment uh, 105. But as we look at this drawing, we have that big, thick line that represents the ground, what we've cut through right in front of our building. There's a little bit here of a hidden line. We're seeing that dashed line. That represents a little hole for that basement window, but we're not seeing it because the dirt's in front of it. So it's shown as hidden. As we move up into the building, if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit and look at this, there should be some black lines that pop out more than others. Do you guys see those lines that pop out more than others? A couple things that, that are, are, are really notable. If we look right up this line here along that little jagged piece, and I'm going to erase that so that, well, it's not covering it up too badly for you. That's one of the bolder lines. If we follow that line around, we can kind of see that that bold line continues and comes back down this side, right? It works its way around the building. That's the big piece of the building. It's shown in bold because it's the outermost edge of that big piece of the building. Furthermore, in the center here, this little piece pops out towards us. It's a little bit darker. This piece on the edge is further away from us. It's a little bit lighter. The piece on the back edge here is also away from us, so it's a little bit lighter. So we're looking at this drawing and are able to distinguish that depth. So that slide that I was showing you with depth applies to this kind of an elevation. 
Another example, this one's a little bit more technical, still a hand-drawn elevation. You get a lot of depth out of what's happening here, just by where the line weights are thickest. So the piece of the building that we can call it the front door in the center of this particular building, you can see that around the edges have that really bold, thick line. That's causing that piece to come toward us. The chimney at the top has a nice, bold line. The main part of the building is a little bit recessed from that front center section. Sorry, I have to be able to draw. This is the front center section that I was talking about. So these lines here that go around this building are the thick, bold lines, likewise around the chimney. That comes toward us. Then the main part of the building is recessed back, therefore it has lighter line weights going backward. The other thing that they've, they've chosen to show on this is they've shown some shadow. So next to all of these, you see these parallel lines that are all running like that. That's representing the shadow that's being cast by the building. Shadows are not always absolute. Sometimes in 130, I think you had to calculate shadows. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that part of 130 where you had to like calculate out the shadows? Uh, frequently on architectural drawings, we just kind of wing the shadows. And you know, oh, it looks like it's about this deep. You'd be surprised how much shadows can control what your perception of the building is. How big a cantilever is based on that shadow. You take the shadow away, it doesn't look like it's a big cantilever anymore. So I, we showed some, or I showed some basic um, hand-drawn examples. Now let's show a bunch of AutoCAD examples. So AutoCAD drawings are distinctly different than those hand examples. You could argue that there's a certain care and a and a certain quality to those hand elevations that we just don't have anymore. This is a much more stark drawing than those ones that I showed. It also happens to be a much more modern building, but it is what it is. So if we look at this, it's really easy to see these key, big, bold lines. The boldest line being at the bottom that represents the ground of the building. You always want that line to be strong. It needs to be thick. It needs to give weight to the bottom of the building. The outline around the building is generally thicker than what's happening inside the building. And things that pop forward become darker. The deck pops toward us, it's darker. The little, um, little pop out to the side on the left side there is recessed, it becomes a little bit lighter. So elevations, it's a lot more about the space. The, the floor plans that we did last class are much more scriptive. The walls are this. The furniture is that, the door swings are this, and it's always the same. Elevations, it depends on what elevation you're drawing. Another example of two elevations here, this one the shadows are pretty heavy. They're pretty bold, they, they, they dominate this. Um, I think it probably would help these drawings a little bit if the shadows were a bit lighter. I think they're a little bit strong. But again, it does show depth uh, and what's happening. It gives us that three-dimensional quality to it. Another example here, this time we have a brick fill pattern. It's a hatch pattern that's on the building. It also has a little bit of a gray shade to it. That's nice and light. They've also filled in the ground with a hatch. It is still an elevation, even though we've cut through the ground and they filled it. Um, so it's just another way of showing the building. The trees are really light, as they should be. They're almost like a construction line. I like this set too because it's kind of it shows you where you can go with building elevations. So at the very top we have the, the basic elevation view. And then we move into the day collage and the night collage. And so with these two collages, you can see how these drawings can go from being just a line drawing into being something that's more of a showcase piece that goes on a board or a competition or, or that sort of thing. We're going to create these by the end of the class, well, I should say, the day ones. We won't do the night ones in this class. We're going to do the day ones uh, by the end of this class. So you'll be able to do this at the end. Not today, but by the end of 135. Another set of elevations. These are a little bit simpler uh, in their basic layout. But we're seeing all four sides of the building here. Th again, things that are closest to us become darkest. Things that are further away become lighter. The shadows here, instead of being filled in gray regions, they're actually a series of horizontal lines. You can do it that way as well, but it is a hatch pattern. Another example of elevations, thickest pieces are coming toward us. 
Another example there. I know this is sideways, so you kind of have to look at it that way. But I just like the drawing so much that I had to include it. A little bit more technical detail. But it's a good example of that thick line. Thickest line at the very bottom. Thickest, the, the next thickest line goes around this all the way, around the outside. And then we have thinner line weights to the inside. Sometimes line drawings become a little bit more collage. In this case, they took the line drawing and they collaged over the top of it. This is something that we'll do in Illustrator. We'll take our drawings and we'll do some collage work over the top of them in Illustrator. It's a good combination. You do the line work in AutoCAD, you do some collage work after all. This is more on the scale of what you're going to be drawing today. It's about the scale of the little cabin that you're working on. So we've got our, our basic pieces. We've got the piece that's coming toward us, identified with the thickest lines. Things that are a little bit further away are step back. Hatches are thinnest. So this came from Tips for Architecture School. If you want to get good at drawing, get good at line weights. And I think this is very, very well said. Because line weights really are what distinguish good drawings from bad drawings. You could have the same technical drawing up on the wall, two people doing the same drawing. The person that does the line weights better, people will always gravitate and look at that drawing. So line weights are absolutely critical for what you're, what you're doing. We're going to switch over, and I'm going to continue working. So while I'm switching, go ahead and open up the floor plan from your last exercise, so two exercises ago that you were working on. We're going to go through and draw those elevations today, and I'm going to walk you through that process. OK, so we're going to continue now actually constructing the elevations for this particular building. And I think one of the things that you'll learn over your course of your studio work and your design work is that architects really never think just in one view. So if, if you're, and, and I think it's always easy for students who are just learning uh, to be in the world of architecture to think of things as, oh, I'm drawing the floor plan. Let me figure out how many square feet this, this needs to have, and then I'll draw a floor plan that looks good. And then afterward, you come to this point and you say, oh, wait, what's the building going to look like from the outside? And so when you're designing a building, the, the more fluent you become in designing a building, the easier it's going to be for you to be thinking about what it looks like from the outside, what it looks like from the inside, what the section looks like, what the elevation looks like, what the details look like, all at the same time. So when I drew this floor plan, I had an idea in my head of what this building was supposed to look like from an elevation perspective. So when I sit down here to draw the elevation, it's pretty easy for me to come through and say, oh, this is what the elevation is going to look like. For you guys, when you, just, you created your building, you may not have spent that much time thinking about what the building elevation is going to look like. And you may be figuring it out today. And that's OK. Um, it's all part of the practice phase. So my, uh, my vision for this building was a little bit more um, modern in its, in, its, in its layout. I wouldn't say it's modernist, but it's almost kind of a Bauhaus concrete thing. Um, but a lot of you are going to want to have pitched roofs, so I'm going to walk you through how to do both. I'm going to do a pitched roof, and I'm going to do a flat roof, so you can see how they, they work together. Uh, or they, or they are, they're, anyway, you get the idea. So we're going to start first with the, the south elevation, which would be the bottom here. Uh, looking, if I was standing right here looking this direction, I'd be drawing this elevation. That's considered the south elevation of the building. So in order to do that, I'm going to first go to my layer properties. And so I'll click the layer properties button, or I could type layer into the command line. And when I do that, I need to create um, a, a layer for the south elevation. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to create a new layer. I'll click on the new layer button. And I'm going to do a dash south elevation. There we go. And I'm just going to leave the line weights rather thin to start. I'll go with maybe a 0.13. And I'll edit the line weights a little bit later on as we, as we go forward. 
So I have a south elevation. Uh, it's set up as white. It's a continuous line at 0.13, and it's printing. That's good. I have a no print layer already. I can use that no print layer for my guides, or I could create another no print layer for guides. I'm going to go ahead and create another one. So I'll go to my new layer, and I'm going to create a layer called guides. This layer here, I'm going to change my color. I'll change it to red this time. And again, these colors are arbitrary. If you want to change it to a different color, that's fine. Um, I have a guides layer. I've changed it to red. Um, as I come over here, I'm going to turn it to non-printing so that it doesn't end up printing in my viewports. And I'm also going to make the guides layer current for right now. So I'll double click on the little parallelogram next to guides and change so that the green check mark is on guides. And now that guides layer is my current layer. So with guides as my current layer, I'm going to use this floor plan as a guide for my elevation. So for example, as I'm looking at this, if I was standing here looking at this, I have some major corners. I have a corner here. I have a corner here. I have a corner directly behind this corner, corner directly behind that corner. I've got a corner out here and a corner out here. That's what I'm seeing on this elevation. So rather than measuring and drawing this from scratch, I'm going to use uh, a tool that's built into AutoCAD that's called a ray. It's a one-sided infinite line in one direction to start at this point and just go straight down. So I'm going to go ahead and type the ray command. So R-A-Y and then hit enter. It is available under draw and it is this one right here if you want to pick the ray command manually. And so what ray does is it says specify start point. So I'm going to start right at that corner, and I'm going to go straight down. Now I have ortho turned on right here. That 90 degree symbol is turned on, so that when I start to draw this, it just goes straight down. And I'll click straight down and hit Enter to finish. So it's going straight down. And it's a little hard for you guys to see the red on the screen. Let me change the color of that layer so that it's easier for you to see. No, that's too close to white. You can't see the difference. How about purple? You guys see purple OK? Yeah? It's always hard to, to make the screen show up nice. OK, so I've done a ray for that corner. I'm going to continue with another ray from this corner straight down and hit Enter. I'm going to do another ray from this corner straight down and hit enter and another ray from this corner straight down and hit enter so your building might be different than mine you might not have any pop outs it might be just two corners and that's it and this is always the case with with when I'm teaching this kind of drawing it's hard because everybody's drawing is a little bit different so you have to interpret a bit as we as we go through so I have these corners I've established now I need a horizontal line to represent wherever the ground's going to be. So I'm going to use, instead of a ray, which is one direction, I'm going to use a construction line, which is infinite in two directions. It's also the key command for it is X line. It's available under the draw menu. It's the dot in the center with the arrows going both directions. Or you can just type X line. I'll type somewhere arbitrarily, I'll click somewhere arbitrarily down here at the bottom. It doesn't matter where, just so that it's in my screen. And I'll have it going off in that direction. And so now I've in, I, I have, oh, it's so weird. On the screen, it, oh, whatever. You can see it, at least, but it's changing colors. So I have that that's kind of vaguely representing, uh, we'll call it the floor of my building, the interior floor of my building. So I'm going to end up drawing slightly below this and slightly above this as I go forward. So now I need a few more pieces of the puzzle. Um, it's time to start actually drawing out kind of the basic shapes of my elevation. So first off, before I move on, I have my guides initially set up here. I'm going to switch my layer so that my current layer is no longer guides. It's on the A south elevation. So I'll double click for A south elevation. And now I can actually start drawing. So I'll choose either the line or the polyline tool. It doesn't matter. 
at this point, and I'll start drawing. So as I start at that point, this is my first wall that I'm drawing up. So I need to have an idea of how tall this, this wall is, or how tall this space is. So in this case, uh, I kind of envision this at about 12 feet. So I'll go ahead and type in 12, followed by the foot sign, or the apostrophe. And then I'll come across to where it meets there, and I'll draw back down. Notice that I didn't, however, draw a line across the bottom yet, because we haven't determined where that bottom really is. This is the interior floor, not the bottom of the elevation. Now we get to this middle section, the bridge portion between these two rooms. It was always intended to be a little bit shorter. So I'll draw that at maybe 10 feet. But when I draw that, I don't want to start here at the bottom and click and then draw up. I want to use those object tracks. So I'll go right there, hover for a minute, move my mouse up, get the dotted line, and then type 10 feet. So I'm starting at 10 feet. I'll come straight across to meet right there. Now this part of the building, I want it to be a little bit taller. Now, I told you guys, remember, that I'm drawing this first as a flat top. I'll deal with the, uh, the, the pitched roof in a little bit. So for right now, this is just boxes. I'll come back to my polyline. I'll start at this point. I'll work my way up. This was supposed to be a little bit taller. I'll say it's 14 feet. I'll come across. And I'll come back down to right there. So I've gone ahead and I've drawn the basic shape of my building, or the basic outline of my building. Now it's time to start filling in other pieces. So for example, on this wall, I have a series of windows. So I can use the ray command, but I want to switch back to the guides layer. And then I can go back to my ray command right here. And I can show this first window. So I've drawn two ray lines coming from each corner of those windows. I could draw them for all of them, but I know these windows are all the same. So I'll draw it for one and then work from there. OK, so for this window, it's above a kitchen counter. Kitchen counter is about three feet. So we'll go up maybe 42 inches before I draw. So I'll go to my polyline. I'll start right there, hopefully. No, nope, looks like it's going to make me. Let me turn. In order to snap there, I'm going to have to turn on my intersection snap. I'm not a big fan of intersection snap, but in this case, it will work. So there we go. And we're going to go up 42 inches. And I'll draw across. So this is one of the things that's going to happen when you start to draw, is you're going to forget to change the layers. It happens. So I'm going to go ahead and draw it, and then I'll change it afterwards. Uh, so this was going to be a relatively tall window. We'll say it's maybe six feet tall. And we'll come over, and we'll come back down like that. Now before I move on, I'm going to take this. There's my window. And I'm going to change it from the guides layer to the south elevation layer so it's on its correct layer, like that. The other thing that I'll do before I get too far is I'll start to add some details to this particular window. So maybe I'll add an interior frame. So these are all separate segments. I'll join them together first. Let me select them all and type join. They become one closed polyline. And then I'll offset it at maybe a uh, specified distance, 1.5 inches. And I'll give myself a little frame around the window. In reality, there's probably a little bit of a frame around the outside of the window, but I also know that these windows are all stacked next to each other, so I don't want to draw that frame until I have all the windows. So I've done this first window, and you know maybe it has an operating piece, so maybe it needs to have a little vent at the bottom, so I'll go up maybe 18 inches. that. And that should be on the south elevation layer. There we go. So maybe that's what it looks like. I'll go ahead and take this whole window, and I'm going to copy it and make multiple copies. Now instead of copying it from down here, I'm just going to copy it from up here. So I'll type copy. I'll copy from this point, and I'll make one on each of these windows. 
And when I come back down here, I have all my windows. So you don't have to see what you're copying. You're just copying. You know where it is on the plan. You're copying it. Now I have all of those windows. Perhaps I want some trim around the windows. So we'll go up here maybe three and a half inches. Something like that. I need all of these pieces. To go on their correct layer. So I'll change them to the south elevation layer. And then a few more little lines. I could probably be copying this. It would probably be more efficient. All right. Once again, we'll make sure all of that ends up on the south elevation layer. There you go. And now I've drawn out that little block of windows. And maybe I don't like it that way. Maybe I don't like my trim around the windows. Whatever. We can, we can modify it. At this point, I haven't assigned any line weights yet. And I could assign the line weights now, or I could wait a little bit. So in this, in this particular instance, um, probably the thickest lines would be the lines that go all the way around the outside. Uh, the thinnest lines would be the interiors of the windows. So maybe I'll thicken up the windows themselves to make these stand out. So we'll take those, and I'll come up to my properties right here, and I'll thicken up the line weights. Um, yeah, we'll go to maybe. 0.2 for those. It's hard because you won't see this yet. You'll see it because even though my line weights are turned on, the scale is such that you won't see it until you print it. Um, and we'll go with that for right now. So I've drawn that particular piece of windows. I would move on and do the next set of windows. There's some windows in here that represent my sliding windows. I draw those next. On this piece of the building, I actually have a second little corner here where this wall sticks out a bit to make a little alcove. So I'd need another ray and another ray over here. And this, there's an interior wall that would be going up here. Whoops. Let me switch my layer so that you guys can see this to south elevation. And I go from here. Um, and I come across and come back down. And then I have some infill windows happening in that particular building. At any point, you can turn off the guides layer, and you can see your building start to take shape. I told you that I was going to show you how to deal with the, the sloping roof if you wanted a pitched roof instead. So I'm actually going to draw the north elevation, the other side of the building, as if it were a pitched building. So that's why I didn't spend too much time working through the rest of the windows yet, is because I want to show you the other side of the building. So for me personally, it makes no difference whether I draw an elevation right side up or upside down. My brain's been trained to be able to draw it equally the same upside down or right side up. So I could actually start drawing the building elevation upside down right on top and fold that fold it out that way. It's a little bit hard, unless you practiced it, to see the building elevation upside down and not get confused. So AutoCAD, lucky for us, has initiated a few commands or created a few commands that make it really easy for you. You don't actually have to rotate anything. You don't have to move anything other than your view. So in the right corner here, there's a little view icon. We're looking at the top view, and we have our north, south, east, and west. We can actually rotate this around. If we click on it, there's a little set of rotating arrows. If we rotate it, it will change our drawing so that instead of being north up, it's now south up. And we can do the same thing for this part of the building. 
So it's pretty cool to be able to do that and to easily flip your view around so that you can keep drawing. So we're going to go ahead and keep drawing in this sense. So once again, to get there, I just hovered over this little tool in the corner, this view, I think it's called the WCS tool, uh, and use these little arrows to rotate the view. I'm going to continue on. Let me switch to my guides layer. I probably need a north elevation layer. So let me go here, and we'll say A dash north. There we go. And I'll do the same thing. So this time, I'm going to use my ray command. And I'm going to use the same guides. That's fine. And we'll go straight down, straight down, straight down. And again, remember, I'm looking for the corners of my building. So I have a corner there, a corner there. This steps back, but there's still a corner here. There's a corner there and a corner there. Now it's time for the line that goes across. So I'll go to X line, and I'll create it. And that gives me a base place to start from. OK, so now we're going to work our way up from here. And this time I told you we're going to work on something with a peak instead. So in this case, I'll come back. Let me switch to my north elevation layer. Oops, and it looks like I made my north elevation pink. We don't want that. Switch it back to white. All right, now I'll start with my polyline tool. And we'll start right down here. And I'm going to come up. Now this, again, is a little bit different because I'm doing it as if it were a peaked roof. So I need to know kind of where this wall is going to end up. Um, do I want it in an 8-foot wall? Do I want a 10-foot wall? Do I want it more than that? So I'm going to call this one a 10-foot wall. And remember, this elevation has nothing to do with the elevation I just drew because they're different buildings. It's as if it has a different building. So I'll say this is maybe 10 feet. And I'll, again, continue kind of straight across, not to this corner, but I'm going to continue it to that corner right there. And we'll come back down. Same thing over here for this building between those two corners. So I'll start with my polyline. I'll go up my 10 feet. We'll come across, and we'll come back down. This upper line here is really just a guide to help me out. Now I need to figure out what this roof is going to look like. And so the, the one thing that we have to kind of think through is, what's the slope of the roof going to be? Is it a 2 and 12? Is it a 4 and 12? Is it a 6 and 12? When I say 2 and 12, 4 and 12, 6 and 12, it means how much rise for 12 inches of run do you have in the roof? So a 2 and 12 would be I go up 2 inches and I go over 12 inches. So I'm going to have a roof that's sloped like this as a 2 and 12. If I have an 8 and 12, I'd go up 8 inches and I go over 12 inches. And I'd have a roof that's sloped like that. So it's a much steeper roof. If I had a 12 and 12, I'd be going up 12 inches and over 12 inches. So depending on the look of your building and what you're trying to create here, you have to decide what's an appropriate slope to your roof. And so in this case, it's kind of cabin, snow country. Typically, the pitches are higher so that it sheds snow. So I do maybe a 10 and 12 or a 12 and 12, something like that. I'm, I'm not going to do a 12 and 12, even though typically I would do a 12 and 12 here, because a 12 and 12 is too symmetrical for you guys to learn how this works. So I want it to be a little more complicated than a 12 and 12. So I'll do a 10 and 12. So rather than figure out uh, how long or what the angle of this line would be, which I could figure out what, they, what the degree angle is, I'm just going to draw a line starting arbitrarily somewhere. Uh, and I'll go over on some increment of 12. So it'll be 12 feet or 24 feet or something like that. So in this case, I'll do 24 feet so that it's long. And I'm going to go up. I told you I wanted to do a 10 and 12, so I would go up 20 feet. So that gives me two points to start working from. I'll start with a line, and I'll go from here to here. Now you guys should be saying, well, wait a minute. Couldn't I have done absolute coordinates? Yeah, I could have. I just wanted to show you the, the rise and the run so you could visualize it. 
So instead, I could have just gone to my line and I could have said at uh, 24 feet, comma 20 feet, and given myself that same line. So I didn't actually have to draw these two. But I was trying to illustrate the rise and the run part. OK, so now I have this line. I'm just going to move it. So I'll type move or use the move tool. Point to move from is the end here. We'll move it to right there. There it is sloping up. I'll take this same line, and I'm going to mirror it. So I'll type mirror or select the mirror command from the center right here. Do I want to erase the source objects? No. And that gives me the basic slope of the roof. I want these two to end, so I can go in and I can trim off the excess. So I'll use the trim command. Select those two objects, press Enter, get rid of that, and get rid of that. And I now have the basic slope of my roof. This slope will work for this part of the building as well. So let me go ahead and copy this to right here. I'll take this and I'll mirror it again across the center. And there it is. So in this case, my two wings are the same size, so my, my pieces end up the same size. Yours may or may not end up the same size. So I no longer need this line that goes across and that line that goes across. So I'm going to go ahead and select both of those. They were polylines. I'll type explode. And I can now delete those two pieces. So I'll select them both and then press delete. And so now I have this piece of roof and that piece of roof. So you can see I always start with the basic shape. Here's my basic shape. And then it's going to be time to start doing some embellishing. So in this case, maybe uh, there's a little bit of an overhang on the outside of the building that I haven't drawn in yet. Uh, if I want to show a little bit of an overhang, I can use this ray that I created. And I can do an offset by whatever the distance of the overhang. If it's a one foot overhang, we'll do a one foot offset. So there it is there and there. Now I could extend this line to meet that line. So this is a lot like trim. It might be underneath. Yeah, it's underneath trim. It's extend, kind of the opposite of trim. Select objects. It would be this object and that object. I'll press Enter. Uh, and then you pick on the edge that you want to extend. So right there, I want to extend that edge out to meet that. So once again, extend this and that, enter, click on that side, enter. And so now I've extended that out a little bit. From here, I typically build up my roof. So there's, there's usually some trim or something that goes on the roof. So maybe I do an offset here. Uh, and we'll do maybe a 2 by 8. I'll keep it in round numbers. I'll do it at 8, even though a 2 by 8 is actually uh, 7 and a quarter. But that's a separate lecture. <laughs> uh, so we'll go an offset of 8 inches. There we go. And there we go. See, I'm starting to build this up. The top here, the peak of the roof, it would be nice if those two things connected together. This is a great opportunity to use your fillet right here. The, the only thing that I'm going to change on the fillet is that my radius, so I type R for radius or click on radius, should be set for 0 which it is. And we can then connect this and this at a point. From here, I can choose how I want my eaves to end. Do I want them to end where they come straight down? Do I want them to end where they angle out? It's a personal preference. I might also add a separate piece of trim. Maybe I want another piece of trim. Let me offset this one at. And this is where, looking at elevations, you can start to see what's happening. So in this particular case, maybe I want this to go this way. I'll draw that, but I want this to be recessed back. So I'll do an offset. That. Oops, that was a rhino command, sorry. 
and I've drawn that edge of my window, or my window, of my roof, of that E. Alternatively, I could do it where they're, they're, instead of sticking out that way, they're clipped. So it would come up to right there. And this one would uh, stick out. Maybe like that. Actually, all of this, let's recess this back so it doesn't look so weird. Let me do some trimming. And something like that. So it's just a different style to the end of the, the eave. I'm showing you these as examples. So now I have drawn in what the top of the building looks like, even though they don't match. Uh, and I do the same thing with the windows that I did before, where I'd put the window in the side. Now, when it comes to drawing the center part of this, it's pretty hard because I don't have any information of how tall it needs to be or where it really belongs. I would need to know the width of this, and I would need to know uh, the height at the slope in order to draw in that piece. So this is where drawing a flat roof is easy, and drawing a pitched roof is a little bit more complicated. Essentially, what I need to do is I need to start drawing the side elevation so that I can feed back on this elevation, so I can work the two together. This piece in the middle of my building is not shown on either outside, so I'm actually technically drawing us more of a section because I need to figure it out uh, in order to draw it. That's individual to my building. It might not happen for yours. You might be able to see it just fine on the outside. So anyway, to switch to the side view, once again, I come back here so that I can rotate my view and I can start working on my side view. So this brings up a good point. There's always a relationship between each of these elevations as we start to fold them out. So the heights of the elevations match up. So let me go ahead for a second and pull down the corners from this side and start drawing the, the base again. So let me go ahead and switch to my guides layer. And I will draw my rays starting at that corner and starting at this corner. This happens to be the easiest elevation on my building. It's two corners and no windows. This is a really easy, simple elevation to do. OK, so then I need an X line that goes across. So I'll choose the X line tool or type X line. And I'll have that go across. So this line has been relatively arbitrary each time I've set it. But where these two lines cross is the same place in each of the buildings. So that will be helpful later on. So we'll leave it right there. And I'm going to go ahead and draw up at least the side. Well, I don't really have to draw it just yet. OK, so like I said, this represents my finished floor. This represents my finished floor for this elevation. And this represents my finished floor for that elevation, even though this is a different elevation. So I can use where these two cross as a reflection line to be able to pull elevations around. So I already know where the peak of this roof is, so I don't have to recalculate where it is. I can actually pull it around. So I'm going to use my ray once again. And I'm going to initiate the ray right where those two lines meet. So it's right there. And this time, I want to draw it at 45 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and press the tab key as I start drawing, and you see that I get to the point where I can choose angle. So my cursor has switched from length to angle, and now I need to type in the angle. So I've got 45, I've got 90, then I need to add another 45, which would get me to 135. So if I type 135, and then I press the tab key again, it's definitely not going in the correct direction. 
Gotta love that. Let me try 45. What? Why is this? Oh, yeah. I rotated my view. That, that's why it's not calculating correctly. Uh, so uh, we're at 135 plus 90 is, my brain is totally not working this morning, 225. 225. There we go, right? Yes, 225, because it would be, yeah. So 225, and I press the tab key. Then I'm going to click. I'm not going to move my mouse. I'm going to click before I move my mouse. Oh, I moved my mouse. Now I have to do it again. So we hit tab, hit tab. There it is, back. Now we click without moving the mouse, and there it is. If you move the mouse, you lose the angle. So you have to make sure the mouse stays in the same spot. Uh, and now I've created that 45 degree reflecting line. And if it helps, you could change the color on that to be a different color. I don't even know if you guys can see any other colors. You see it as green? Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to turn off the topography for just a second. It's starting to get a little difficult for you guys to see exactly what I'm working on. What is this? OK, so I have this reflecting line. So the advantage here is as I start to draw my rays, I can use this elevation that I already drew to pull information over to draw this elevation. So I'll once again use my ray. And I'll start at the peak. There's my peak. We'll come down where it intersects this line right there. We go across. Now we know where the top of my building is. So the ridge of my building, I'm just going to draw this on the north elevation layer. is right there. I can re go back and repeat my ray. And I know not where this <coughs> wall is, but where the eave is would be right there. And we go across there. And I would draw my next line from there to there. I have a couple extra pieces of trim. So I would once again go back to my um, guides layer, go back to my ray there. And there. There. I believe that in 130, you guys covered the idea of a reflecting line, right? So you should see it a little bit. Same thing happens in practice here. So there we go. I've drawn those over. Let me switch to my north elevation layer. And once again, I will draw. There's two. And there is three. So I've drawn those pieces. Now I need the sides. Well, remember, I had a little bit of an overhang. If I want an overhang at the front, I need to extend these out a little bit as well. So we'll go out by one foot, and we'll come down. We'll go out by one foot, and come down. I can use extend. to extend that side and to extend that side. And then I need the lines that come down there and right there. And so I was quickly able to construct this elevation. And I know I still left the bottom of my building empty for a second. If I needed this piece, now I could work on it in section right here and pull the lines back through to know where the peak would be, uh, or excuse me, where the ridge would be going across. I'll do that, but I don't want to spend, I mean, I can spend all class just talking to you about creating the elevations. It's already 917. So I'm, I'm sensitive to you guys need time to practice this stuff too. Um, so let me talk through the one last thing that I, I, that I wanted to talk through, um, and that is how do you sh figure out where the topography lines would, would fall at the bottom of your building? 
Now, if this part, this next part that I'm talking about goes over your head and you feel like I really don't understand it, I'm OK if you concentrate on the building elevations and you give yourself a line at the bottom. The line, however, should not be here. It should be down at least a foot from where this is. It's probably down two feet in reality. So if you were going to draw it, um, there would be a foundation line. So we might come from here. We might go down another foot. We come across and back up from that finished floor. And then there'd be a little bit of a foundation. So we'd go down again by another, um, let's do eight inches. That's the minimum. Come back and back up. This line here would then become your really thick base for your building. I'll select it just for illustration purposes and change the thickness here up to maybe like 0.8. So there's the ground. So if you feel like you get lost when I do the topography part, this is what you're doing to finish off the bottom of your building. So go down a foot, draw a line across, go down another eight inches, and draw a big line. That's bold. That'll finish off your building, and I'm, I'll be happy with that. If, however, you want to actually calculate where the slope is hitting your building, I'm going to show you how to do that. But before I do it, I'm going to clean up this drawing slightly so that there's not so many things, uh, there's not so many guidelines and whatever. So let me go into my layer properties. I'm going to turn off my guides. Um, good, that's good. I'll leave everything else back on. And I want to turn on my topography. There it is. I'm going to do this elevation right here as I do this. So what I need to know is I need to know where is this elevation view happening. And so where the elevation view is taken is essentially on a line that is happening right in front of your building. And ideally, it's right on kind of the front of your building. So I'm going to do an X line. And let me create a new uh, guides layer for us. Uh, this is going to be guides-topo. Hopefully, you can see orange. OK, I'll make that my active layer. And then I'm going to create an X line uh, that goes in both directions. Yes, you can see that line OK, along the front of my building. Notice that this front isn't the one I picked. It's the one closest to me. So it's that front edge right there. In reality, you could take the elevation a little bit out if you wanted to, but we're going to draw it as if it's right on that front elevation. So I've drawn that front elevation. And as I look at it, this line crosses the topo at a variety of places. I'm going to do a ray command from each of the places that it crosses. And I need to go a couple out on either side. So maybe this one, that one, that one. And that one, for example. I'll come down here to an arbitrary distance. I'll do an x line. And then I'm going to offset this x line at one foot. So I'll do offset, one foot. And I'm going to do it the number of times that I copied the topo, or that I did these um, lines. So I have four. I have four intervals going up. Now, we know that the, the topo slopes up in this direction. So this is the highest point. This is the lowest point of what I'm drawing. This is the highest point. That's the lowest point of what I'm drawing. I need to draw a sloping line that goes through those points. So I'll come, uh, let me switch to my, this was my south elevation layer. I need a line that goes through points. So I'll pick this one, which is called a spline. And I'm going to start at this first intersection. I'll go to the next intersection, and I'll go one down there. I'll go to the next intersection, and I'll go another one down. 
and I'll go to the last intersection, and I'll go another one down. Looks like I had a few too many lines created. This line right there, and I'm going to thicken it up so you can see it a little bit easier, represents the slope along the back side of the building. So now that I have this slope, I can move it straight up. So I'll type move. It's just going straight up toward my building. Now I need to deal with this part of the building. Same thing applies where I need to go down a foot. So I'll come here, I'll go down a foot, and I can come over and connect to that part of my building. This is going to continue across. I could actually draw it all the way across to there. I had this with a little porch on the outside. That's why it's going to be drawn like that. This will come straight down like that. So I went down the extra foot. That gave me the, the bottom of my building. We now need that extra little bit, that 8 inches. So I'll come down by 8 inches, and there it is. Now, in the flat version, I had you come down at 8 inches on this side and draw a straight line across. In this version, because of the slope, we're going to move this up until it intersects with that line. So I'll type move. I'm going to move from that point directly to the intersection, and then I'll come up to where that meets. So at the back corner, it's 8 inches, but at this corner, it's a little bit longer. So we can draw that line down right there. Now, as I move my way around to the next elevation, I have to pay attention to how far down it is on this corner. So I'm going to do one more round of topography so that you can see it again, but also so you can see how these two connect. So bear with me for a second as we, as we rotate one more time around. Oops. There we are. I'll do the topography again. I'm actually going to delete all of this. I won't delete that one, but I'll delete these. There we go. And I'm going to create another X line, again, along the plane that's closest to me. So I'll do X line, and it should be going in both directions. That should have been on the topo guides layer. There it is. And I'm going to work my way with my contours. Same thing. So let me switch to the guides layer. We'll go to ray. We'll do there. We already have one at that. Uh, we need one right here. Right there. Right there. So there's my lines. Ignore this one for just a second, because that's the corner of my building. Um, I could actually change those two. Into a different color, just to make them a little bit clearer. And let me go ahead and create those uh, X lines and then offset them by a foot. Offset, one foot. OK, same thing. This one's the tallest, and we're going to work our way down. So I'll use the spline tools, but I need to be on the elevation layer. And we're going to spline. One, two, three, and four. I'll thicken that up so you can see it a little bit better. There you go. So now I have the slope on this edge at that elevation. But where does it fall up here? Let me get rid of the flat version. We don't need the flat version. I had my 8-inch line on this side. And it would be easy to, oops. Did I just delete? It would be easy to say, oh, well, I have the 8-inch line right here. So I just move this one up, same thing, till it meets the 8 inches. Except that it was more than 8 inches where the ground met on this edge of the foundation. Sorry, you have to look sideways at this one. Let's see if I can show you. Oops. Clearly, I keep clicking the wrong. 
this from here to here on this edge of the elevation was more than eight inches. So as the slope continues around, we have to start from that point. So in that case, I need to either measure this distance, so I can use the measure tool and say, how far is it from here to there? Looks like it's one foot three and seven eighths. Or if I had my reflecting line from before, I could pull that line around and then know where it hit this elevation. But I don't have that reflecting line, so I'll do one foot three and seven eighths. So let me switch my view. I can't get this rotation correct. I have to rotate the wrong direction. There we go. So as this line here gets closer, like that, I need to know not where 8 inches is, but instead where 1 foot 3. And if I w need to type in 7 eighths, do dash 7 over 8, like that. So 1 foot, 1 apostrophe, 3 dash 7 slash 8 inches, like that. Now, that line right there is the 1 foot 3 and 7 eighths. I just need to move this line up to meet it. So let me take this, move. I'm going to move right down there to that intersection, and I'll pull it up to right there. So this slope is relatively subtle. It's not like it's at the side of a cliff or something, but it is definitely a slope nonetheless. We can see now that the front of this building, this line, is going to be a lot further down. Let me go ahead and trim that off to right there, than where it was in the back corner. So I started the, at that upper corner with 8 inches, and I'm working my way around the building. Now when I went to do this elevation, we're going back up. So this here is the lowest point, and I'd be going back up around those two sides. So I've come down, down, and then down. This is the lowest corner. We go back up and back up to make them all match up. I know the topos a little bit on the advanced side, but I had to throw it out because some of you guys are really you know, fluent in AutoCAD anyway, and so there's no reason why you couldn't try to tackle something like this. Um, so this is the challenging part. Remember, if you don't feel comfortable with it, don't worry about it. There's plenty of time to learn these skills down the road. I just like to throw it out there because I've got a, a breadth of people in this class that have different skill sets. So you can always just do the flat line, and I'm OK with that. The goal today is to get your elevations done. Um, there's no way, given the amount of time you have left, that you can do part four, which is the roof plan. Um, so just don't worry about that part, OK? Um, when you're done, give me a publish to web JPEG like you've been doing of at least one of the elevation views. The, uh, this is part of your assignment 105. You have to do all four of the elevations as part of your assignment 105. So this is something that you're going to end up having to do anyway. So the, the further along you get before next Monday, the better. Next Monday, we're going to take this and actually create a layout. We're going to talk about something called paper space. And how do you create these drawings that are kind of scattered and upside down and backwards and align them all onto a page and get them out of, uh, of AutoCAD? So if you have the elevations done beforehand, you can do a lot of the work on assignment 105 on Monday. So you'll be ready to move on. So I encourage you between now and then to try to finish all four of the elevations, even though you probably don't have enough time in class to finish all of the elevations. Okay. Sorry I talked a long time today. It was just one of those days. <clears throat>